Welcome back to our second segment here on at uh, KHTS, 1220 AM, your hometown station. I'm Tom Burden, the orthopedic program manager with Providence Holy Cross Medical Center at the Providence Holy Cross Health Hour. And, um, you know, Justin Powell, our, our uh, director of sports here at hello, KHTS, hello. Uh, and I are just, you know, we're kind of kind of spitballing it through a, a conversation on sports injuries and things that are kind of going on. And, and during the break, uh, we were just kind of chatting about uh, the idea of overtraining. And, you know, it's it's so interesting, in that having been in private practice up here in Santa Clarita uh, and uh, having been a part, I was a baseball player uh, through high school and had my own injuries throwing okay. uh, and overthrowing and uh, couldn't go on playing any further, uh, that uh, uh, this one kind of hits near and dear to me. And I can tell you, gosh, last year alone, I was uh, during the summertime, I was probably treating four, four kids under the age of 19 who either had ulnar collateral ligament uh, injuries on their throwing arm or had already gone through Tommy John surgery. And it's amazing to me because I could tell you, I mean, I've been doing this for 27, 28 years now, and I can't count on one hand the number of those throwing injuries I had in my first 10 years, and the numbers are just going up and up and up. That's incredible to me. And you know, it's it's. Uh, uh, I was lucky enough to be a part of, a, of an organization, uh, Dr. Jim Andrews, uh, was uh, our uh, kind of chief medical officer, if you will, and uh, he has spoken very, uh, very has been very outspoken on the concept of overtraining, overusing single sport athletes uh, as we're growing up, and uh, um, you know I, I I have to concur with him on a, on a number of different things, in that you know you 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 kind of I liken us, and I know we've used this before, you know we're like a car. Okay, and, and uh, you know, the car itself moves, it's a machine, it's a beautiful machine, it's a very integral machine, uh, and some of the smallest little activities can cause the greatest amount of problems, like having your wheel out of alignment, and how that can actually affect the tire wear, the brake wear, the suspension, uh, as well as your gas mileage, uh, and generalized safety. And so, uh, anytime you see this, and then you continue driving, and continue driving on it, and don't give it a break, all of a sudden, we find uh, that the damage continues to get worse, and worse, and then there's a point of no return where intervention is required, uh, as opposed to just doing general maintenance type stuff. And one of the things that we're finding with our baseball players is that they're playing spring ball, they play summer ball, they usually have coaching in between, they also have practices, they might be on a different team, they might be on two teams, maybe a regular little league team and then maybe a club team or a travel ball team. There'll be fall, fall ball, usually there's winter ball, uh, and they move right back into spring ball, and they continue to throw and continue to throw. And, uh, you know, I, I can remember hearing conversations uh, amongst parents, because uh, my son played over at Hart uh, High School, um, and he, you know, the parents were saying, you know, well, if you have perfect form, then you can throw all the time and not hurt yourself. And, you know, that that is one of the most one of the most ridiculous things I think that I've ever heard. That sounds so damaging it's, to to a to a, an athlete to to tell an athlete something like that too. You know, I, I like to think that I know how to tie my Chuck Taylors, and I think that as an expert at tying my Chuck Taylors, I'm fine. <laughs> but you know what? After a while, the shoelace frays on that eyelet, and that shoelace will eventually no break. No matter what. No matter what. There's nothing you can do about it. And so a lot of the things that we're finding is that you know when you have the athletes that are multi-sport, that once the sport is done, they move on to something else. They're giving that body part a break, and they're retraining something else, uh, and that's been extremely helpful and why. Watching. And, you know, historically, when you look back in the day when, you know, the Bob Fellers were, you know, throwing 50, 60 games a year or something like that, I mean, and, and they never had any problem because when the season was done, they went off to their off-season job and they worked and they gave their body that break. And spring training was really there to dust the rust off not as a tryout. It was more so to just get them ready to move into the season uh, and spend those six weeks to get themselves back in shape from the rest that they just took. And I think that's one of the reasons why there was such great success and why they could pitch into their... Gaylord Perry was, what, 45 when he retired or 46? Phil Necro, the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's amazing to see that. And that's why I love... I mean, that was a perfect analogy that you gave about the car because that's exactly what happens. It's this constant wear and tear and repetition on the same exact muscle groups or the same exact body parts doing the same things over and over again. And that's why I especially uh, preach to my, to my uh, friends and their families and, and young people that 
by using uh, different muscles all the th year round doing different things, different motions, which is what you get if you play, say you play soccer and you take a break and then you play baseball for a few months, you take, give a break with, with your arm and the same exact movements that you give your arm. Instead of doing those things year round, you not only do you strengthen the, the, other, the other parts of your body, you give that, that much needed rest to those body parts who are taking such a toll. And, and I don't think people realize, just like you said, again, with, with the Chuck Taylors, with the shoelaces being frayed, your body's going to wear and tear no matter what. It's going to break down because of uh, constant and and crazy strong physical exertion. It's going to have problems. That is a great point too, because that's one of the things we're also finding is that um, you know the youth today is far better trained and they have much better technique now. And because of that, they can actually they're actually um, doing things physically that we wouldn't have seen such a young age you know where where we hear about kids throwing in the 80s and they're 12 you know which is just amazing and the, but the stresses that places on the body and not having the the physical development to protect the joints you know that makes it difficult as well and so there we do see and I mentioned this before there is a very large reward there's a small group of people who who have the talent mm -hmm. um, and I think some of it in inherited talent um, and uh, the drive to be able to move on to to get a scholarship you know which nowadays is going to save you hundred and fifty thousand oh, yeah. dollars that they can go ahead and play ball and and get their education for free and and one of those lucky few who actually can move into the pro ranks and actually get paid um, you know they can set themselves up financially for the rest of their lives and uh, uh, you know, doing something that they love, uh, hopefully that they love, and that they haven't burned out too soon. Um, and so, that being said, maybe we need to do a better job of aftercare. You know, maybe how we care for the athlete. If they're going to continue to play maybe a single sport, then maybe maybe we need to take better care of that car. You know, it's a, a, a Ferrari. They need to get tuned up like every thousand miles because of its performance. And maybe we need to start treating our kids more like that Ferrari and doing more on our aftercare if we if we can't get them into multiple sports to to kind of create that that little break to allow their body to recover maybe we can actually move into uh, how to allow a person to recover well so that they can be more successful the next time they go out to play making better decisions and and that's that's perfect uh, into what, what we want to talk about next because that's the next thing so how can we best prepare our athletes young or you know, especially going into college when you're still growing, after the fact, after they've exerted themselves physically, what is the next step in in a recharging kind of the the, the batteries of the body, like re um, instituting rest and things like that? What do you see in in obviously in your department as the director of orthopedics at Providence? What do you see as uh, some new things that we're doing to now help our athletes? post training or post game oh excellent the uh, um, well I, th I think is reaching out to the community the medical community and the training community I think that's extremely helpful uh, so that way you can have uh, a group of very tr well trained eyes actually take a look at the at the at the athlete and see what they do now I had a, a phone a phone conversation a, a physician had referred a um, a pitcher over to me who was going to be has a scholarship but was noticing they were having some discomfort and they didn't want to institute going into any rehab have right off the start um, but they wanted to know what my impression was of of their at of their child and uh, nowadays you can find anything online so I went on YouTube and I found the, the picture and I actually had the opportunity to watch some tape and was able to notice that where his symptoms were in his elbow and along uh, the funny bone if you will the on ulnar nerve, the ulnar nerve. Um, the, uh, if you if you throw the ball when you release the ball if the ball is outside of your elbow as you release it creates a momentary torque on the elbow which causes it to bend in such a way that puts stress over that area of their elbow and on their ulnar nerve and when that actually happens um, time and time and time again you begin to have micro traumas to the area leads to inflammation in the such inflammation and that inflammation, which is natural, you know, our body really only has a couple of responses. It's soreness, inflammation, stiffness, 
cramping. You know, though mm -hmm. it's we're very simple in that sense, and that we really do want to listen to these uh, to these pieces. But technique. So technique is is probably one of the biggest pieces to decreasing uh, the amount of uh, uh, problems that we can have. So proper technique can decrease the risk for injury as opposed to just going out there and just chucking the ball. And so, you know, places like the uh, uh, the baseball teams, uh, what it's uh, the baseball academy out here for pitching uh, over in Canning Country. Mm -hmm. You know, they they focus so much on the actual process of throwing and the cr and a correct way that's going to decrease the amount of stress the release point all those kind of things yeah and then how to do a leg drive and then mm -hmm. how to train to do all of this you know a lot of times with the young man that I was watching pitch his throwing motion was mostly coming from his arm where in actuality your your greatest success is going to come from your legs and from your trunk the arms there is just as an extension of the whip and you know because of that you know that was putting an additional amount of stress because then he would fatigue so training well knowing that your sport whatever the sport is we're just talking about baseball but whatever the sport is actually look at the sport what is required is it explosive short you know if you're a lineman what do you have to do my job as a lineman is to be able to push something at equal to my weight for about three to five seconds hard mm -hmm. and fast and so we should train ourselves in that fashion so going out and running a marathon is not going to help you on the football field being able to sprint 10 to 15 yards at a time time and time and time and time again and then hitting the sled that is going to really make a big difference and because you're training yourself appropriately in a manner that is going to meet the needs for what that sports going to be and we can do that with baseball that's part of it. Now the other issue is, is then we know that those little micro traumas, they're natural. They're going to occur because of the stresses we place on ourselves. So now we need to recover. Okay. And that's one of the other big pieces too. So I really profess the idea and I, I have the uh, luck to be able to not only work with athletes, but with dancers uh, and a, a large variety of different types of people is to actually look at your cool down. You know, you've finished with your work, you've finished the hard work. We've got a lot of metabolic stuff that's building up within our tissues uh, from all of that work. <laughs> and, excuse me, and no that's problem. natural. And, uh, um, and so we need to get that out. And so just going out and walking will make a big difference. You know, take a walk for five minutes, allow the body to cool down, utilize arm swings and leg movement to decrease, to increase the pumping of the muscle, which will help relieve any of that uh, build up some. And then going into a simple stretching program, uh, something that will affect the places that we know that we've used a lot so that we can restore its natural length because our bodies will want to shorten. And for those of you who go to the gym and you do a heavy chest day, when you go walking out, your shoulders roll forward. And then if you don't make the adjustment to open the shoulders back up, over time you will sus you will then start to assume that posturing. That posturing then sets the shoulder blade in the wrong position and because of that all of a sudden your mechanics are going to be off and then you're at risk. So those little compensations and mechanic changes can actually lead to more injury. And this is exactly why we're talking about these kind of topics and why we're doing this today is because I, I don't think uh, parents and even athletes really understand Still, now, now, yes, has our technique in in actual sports uh, uh, focusing in on certain movements in the, within the sports. As those get better, I still don't think that we fully understand and comprehend how important it is after post game and post workout. These cool down tactics, these cool down, uh, these are, these are these are skills in of themselves. These are how you preserve your body and, and keep your body as healthy as possible. And I think a lot of times uh, we go hard, our, our athletes go hard, and then they say, okay, we're done, I feel fine. After we've done, we're done playing, I feel okay, I don't need to really do anything else now. But doing these simple things like a post stretch and then cooling your body down slowly and bringing it back to a, a state of, I don't know if equilibrium is the right word, but a state of, of rest, actual rest, that is how you prolong yourself and, and preserve yourself going forward. And I think that's a great. It's thing you it, said. you're absolutely 100 right, 100 percent right. The you know it's 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 the proper cool down, bringing yourself back to a more normal state is going to be a, a huge deal. But realizing that 
physiology happens, okay, and that, and I think that's probably one of the biggest key points is that our bodies all work very similarly. They do go through the same processes. They, the, the chemical reactions are the same. Um, how we use oxygen, how we use glucose, how we use uh, uh, carbon dioxide when we're working anaerobically. You know, when there's not a lot of oxygen around, uh, and and what is the byproduct of that? It's basically the same for all of us. And so because of that, the aftercare, as you said usually people don't worry about aftercare until they hurt and the exactly. downswing to it is is that you know we would we take our car in for oil changes and tune-ups we don't wait for it to make a noise we just do it because we know it's proper maintenance to keep that car running because it's an investment all right and our ch our kids are investments our bodies are our investment and uh, you know the reward on that investment as if you know, we look at financially in the long run you know we would like to be 60 it's and 70 huge, years yeah. old and and not miserable and we don't want to have things happen too late. We don't want to be too late in these in these types of things. Uh, after your body is screaming, screaming, screaming for so long, once you finally bring it in, like you're bringing in the car that late, uh, you might have done damage that is going to take a lot longer to recover from. And that's when I when we see things like, like you said, Tommy John and things like that, where or maybe if if we change the process sooner in terms of post game and things like that uh, maybe you can pre help prevent some serious injuries down the road and utilize your professionals around too because I can tell you there was a, a really interesting case that I had where somebody had come in and they had rotator cuff tendonitis they were a pitcher and uh, the problem has been going on for about a month month and a half or so and so they were referred over for therapy and and uh, uh, which is what I do was doing you know as a clinician and uh, you know, in, chat, in talking with the athlete, uh, I said, you know, when, when did this come on? What things had changed? What was different? Because his throwing, he said he, he was throwing no more, no less than normal. His training stayed on. However, he did indicate about two months before his shoulder started to bother him, he had sprained his ankle. And I said, oh, well, how's that doing? He says, it's still sore. And, and I said, when is it sore? Well, he says, it's sore when I bring my toes up towards my shin. Which, and I said, which foot was that? And he said, well, it's my landing foot it's when I pitch. Foot. There you go. So as soon as he lands on his foot, trying to progress his body weight over that during his follow through um, was too painful. Everything's and, compensating And now. so he shortened his stride. And when he shortened his stride, his arm got behind and you're gonna throw the ball high all the time until he overcompensated with his shoulder mm -hmm. and overreached repetitively and that change in mechanics and that compensation eventually caused irritation to his rotator cuff tendon. He re recovered beautifully. We actually had more success with his shoulder by taking care of his ankle um, and then treating the shoulder as well and re restored his mechanics to what he was used to doing and he went on and did great. But it was it was looking at that and it's, it, you know, I, I referenced back in covering Pac-12 swimming championships years ago, you know, someone walked in and they said, hey, listen, my, my shoulder's really sore. Uh, can you take a look? And, and I, I I had told her, oh, of course, of course, and she was just talking to her, her teammate, and I noticed she couldn't turn her neck. So I just asked, I said, what side do you breathe on? Well, I breathe on this side. Oh, well, you don't have enough movement in your neck to actually clear to clear the water to breathe. So they ended up having to overcompensate on their, sh on their stroke, and so I treated the neck, treated the chest, because things were tight, mm -hmm. and then treated the shoulder, and she went out and swam a record. So it, it, and then she walked by and she said, I don't know what the heck you just did. And it's just, well, we just got you mechanically right. That's all, that's all the goal is, is to make you more mechanically right. And that's why you want to go to your instructors and go to your trainers and go to your therapists uh, and, and talk with them to see what is it going to take to make my performance better? Can you bring me back to factory condition, if you will, and then allow me to progress off of that? All of these things, uh, I feel like the umbrella that the theme of what you've, we've been talking about for the last uh, 15 to 20 minutes is communication. Like the importance of communicating these types of things. You have to obviously, as as a as a physician or things like that, ask the right questions. Of so, what's what's wrong with your? Oh, your ankle's still hurting. Well, let's let's look. Let's take a, a minute back and think about this then. But I think it's it's important for parents and athletes and everyone to always be in constant communication about what's going on with your body. Stay in tune with yourself and if you do that then again these things can probably be prevented. Some things can, we can hit things and get to things earlier in the process of injuries before and be preventative of 
stronger and and more difficult and challenging injuries in the future. And de- and have and communication is huge is and realizing that it is okay that if you have a squeak it's not a sign of weakness if you talk about it because that is actually uh, uh, an issue that from years ago that I can remember hearing is I don't want to hear about your little ache and pain mm-hmm. everybody has pain you go out and go do this and it's that attitude is causing uh, uh, can cause someone to go out and continue to work on and utilize something that may not be in the best shape that could lead to further injury and co- and or compensation which down the line can lead to mechanics issues and will lead to injury later on so and and toughness is not based on that you know anymore toughness is based on how long can you can you perform at a, at a level you know we, we we can change those types of mentalities and we can help ourselves we can, we can help ourselves be better we sh- if we do we that. should think of cal ripken you know, yeah, have, being exactly. able to sustain how many years of continuous play, uh, you know, and, and Jeter, the same thing, you know, to be able to have that wonderful career, uh, you know, with, with, uh, uh, without much or zero interruption. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. We're going to go ahead and go to a break and kind of wrap things up. I'm Tom Burton, Orthopedic Program Manager with Providence Holy Cross Medical Center here on the Providence Holy Cross Health Hour and KHTS, your hometown station. Be back soon. Now, welcome back here on KHTS, your hometown station. We're listening to the Providence Holy Cross Health Hour. And, uh, you know, we're on our last little wrap-up here on this really dingy kind of a uh, pre-holiday day. Very nice. Christmas tree Ominous going. There, and there, uh, gloomy. I know, really, right? They were talking about snow in the mountains coming up for Christmas Eve, going into Christmas morning. So good. So, so good. And, uh, you know, we've had the, uh, one, I mean, I love talking about this stuff and uh, uh, a great conversation. I appreciate Justin for, uh, for, for stimulating this uh, over the last bunch of months and I'm glad we get a chance to get it going but you had a question yeah well I know we we talk about we were talking about things after the fact and and post treatment things like that now I'm curious about ice baths now I I know because I know a lot of athletes professional athletes and stuff are getting into more cryogenics and things like that what what exactly is the the physical benefits to like ice for a seat i know a lot of a lot of people always are think oh man it's just ice it's just heat it's not that big of a deal what exactly are the benefits to these things that were that it seems like technology is going a lot forward more forward with as we go as we move on in sports medicine and things like that yeah we're looking at and and trying to get an idea as far as how can we allow an athlete um to recover quicker and safely to be able to to perform again uh, with less discomfort, you know that delayed onset muscle soreness, which is very common as an athlete, you know that by itself may cause you to move differently because you're tight and sore. And so the question is, is why are we tight and sore? And so we talked about physiology, and we know that there's micro traumas that occur, and we know that the body goes through specific um, responses when there's micro traumas. You know that uh, uh, that their capillaries change and their permeability, that they actually will release stuff into the tissue uh, that stuff causes uh, irritation uh, to the in the localized area and you'll actually find that the nerves might uh, uh, become in, uh, involved as well with this uh, like localized inflammation but it's a physiologic response and so uh, but there it's a required response you know inflammation is actually one of the first stages to healing so we actually need it to occur but okay. can we control it you know do we need to have this full-blown inflammatory process to hit in order to to repair a micro trauma and uh, and so what we've instituted in the concept you know it's simple you you a lot of people ask ice versus heat and we look at the concept behind ice versus heat ice in essence causes what we call vasoconstriction it actually slows blood flow Mm -hmm. uh, to an area where heat causes vasodilation to try to increase blood flow from an area now one of the reasons this is important is is that we actually have to increase because heat needs to bring blood into the area to draw the heat away from the skin so there's no skin injury ice on the other hand it's going to shunt blood into the trunk because it doesn't want to freeze it's a protective response and so we can utilize that protective response and decreasing the amount of uh, vascular pressure that's going into those capillaries to lessen the amount of spillage into the tissues and that's one of the reasons why ice can be so effective for short term all right for short term for for what we would deem as an acute injury 
small amounts of time. You know, you don't ice for 30, 40, 50 minutes. You don't want to burn the skin. And there's also something too, if you've been out in the cold. Now, uh, uh, we were lucky enough, we went to Green Bay to go watch a football game. In I did the last year, it's amazing, yep. And oh my God, it was so cold. <laughs> it's amazing about every 15 to 20 minutes, you have this just warmth that goes through your body and then you go right back to freezing again. And that's called the wow. hunter's response. And okay. it's an actual reflex of response where the body will flush blood to the surface to try to get uh, uh, the body warm again to decrease skin injury. And so icing on acute injuries, uh, 10 to 15 minutes at a spell. Uh, ice baths are hugely effective, especially if you've done a lot of leg work, uh, skating or um, running. Uh, football players are using it. Swimmers are doing ice baths as well. Uh, we see recovery suits, which are basically um, graded uh, pressure suits that you can wear that helps move that uh, lymph lymphatic fluid from the system and move it back towards the trunk where the body can process it. Because sometimes that lymphatic fluid can cause stiffness and soreness as well. And so um, we're getting better. We're realizing that we can do, we can work on the vascular system to decrease the amount of spillage. We know we can use uh, uh, restriction suits or compression suits to be able to help move lymphat lymphatic fluid out, uh, which is great. And then the question comes up, when do you start using heat? You know, once you, it takes about 12 hours or so, 14 hours to get past that, um, that spillage piece. And then we can move from that spillage piece, we can start looking maybe the next day, start looking at maybe utilizing heat. Utilizing heat to die. And then, and then to increase circulation for the healing process, also it allows the tissue to be a little more malleable too. So you can begin your stretching. Uh, you know, always follow your um, advice though from your medical professional who you're seeing for that injury or the such, uh, because they're gonna wanna know what you're doing and have a little say in that. So that way we can be making really good decisions so that the outcomes are gonna be stupendous. Well, Tom, I want to thank you for allowing <clears throat> both of us to have this dialogue. I, I think it's something that's so beneficial to not only the Santa Cruz community, but anyone who, who, wants to, who needs to know about sports injuries and how they can be uh, preventable or treated and just a lot of information. You've been, you're a wealth of knowledge and I, I respect you and appreciate you so much uh, being back here, getting to uh, uh, sit here and, and listen to you talk to, to your other doctors and things for uh, once a month for an hour. And so I just want to thank you. And, and thank you very much, too. I mean, you, you make this happen. And, and to KHTS, uh, you know, Providence Holy Cross owes a lot to KHTS for allowing us to uh, to continue to to try to integrate ourselves within the community and for us to have a voice uh, in Santa Clarita itself. And it's that is so, so wonderful that we do have this opportunity. And, uh, you know, I, I can just say, you know, with the Providence Holy Cross uh, Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Institute, uh, which will be uh, coming on, into effect, our executive uh, team is all set up and and uh, we're looking to be a part here in Valencia so uh, again thank you very much and I, I wish everyone a wonderful holiday a great healthy happy new year upcoming and uh, look forward to talking with you all uh, on joining us the third Wednesday of the month in January we'll meet again <laughs>